John. Man. Isn't it nice when something we've been predicting for ages finally happens? When I say nice, I mean kind of intellectually satisfying as opposed to actually nice when it comes to this week. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking intellectually satisfying watching the kind of great burning and bursting of the <laughs> bond bubble, mm. um, which could uh, uh, have actually, I suppose, very messy consequences, although thankfully so far it doesn't seem to be having that many. Because so everyone seems begun, to be on John. edge. What do you mean so far? It's only been a couple of days. <laughs> I guess I'm still, now that it's happening, I'm kind of worried. That's the problem. Um, you know, to, for context, you've written about this in your newsletter and everyone should read your money distilled on this. What's it called, that one? It's uh, the bond market was in a bubble, now it's bursting. Now it's no, bursting. No, or was it? No, the bond bubble. Okay, the precise headline yeah, is something not right. Happened to Basically, it. There's right. a bond bubble. Yeah. There's a bond bubble. It's yes, ending. It's done. Uh, so, you know, yield, <laughs> yields have gone to um, highs we haven't seen for ages across the board. It's yeah, happening at least in every four, single 15 market. Years. You can't blame Liz Trust because she's got nothing to do with Germany <laughs> or the US, as far as we know. Uh, so, we're seeing bond yields going up everywhere. That's got consequences for so many things. It's almost ridiculous. But, of course, one of the, one of the consequences, of course, is for governments because this means that their, their debt payments go up and up and up. We already know that across the developed world, mm. uh, debt to the GDP is, is 100% plus, you know, up from 70 to 80% before 2008. So, you know, this is this is massive. And when your interest costs go up on that, you're in a lot of trouble. What yeah. do you cut? Well, this is it. And the, the problem is, so at the same time, I mean, I suppose we're seeing it here at the moment, like everyone's kind of talking about growth, growth, growth. But at the same time, it's kind of like, oh, well, yeah, but we have to cut everything at the same time. Mm. Mm. Um, and I mean, without a kind of serious kind of overhaul of the actual structure of the state, which is probably something we'll be talking about later today, but, um, you know, all of this, uh, you know, hopes that by, say, cancelling HS2, we can spend that money there. It's all kind of dancing on the edge of the volcano uh, because everything, every kind of country has got this massive kind of debt to GDP problem. And it's kind of a, a matter of, well, how is that going to end up resolving itself? And I think that's why we're going to have to have a lot of inflation in the future, because that kind of is the only way to resolve it. And we have a lot of inflation, rates stay high. And if rates stay high, yeah. that's got consequences for every single asset class that has soared on the back of very low rates. Mm -hmm. And we might have seen, we might have seen uh, markets fall from their highs, but they're still way too high relative to this level of bond yield. And that goes for property markets across the board, yeah. equity markets across the board, all that private equity, all that venture capital. Anything I haven't mentioned yet that's in trouble? No, but I, I guess, I mean, this, I, this is the, there's kind of two problems, I think. Uh, one is the kind of immediate problem of there's government debt basically sitting everywhere based on various assumptions. The assumption that it's safe, the assumption that it only goes up, um, the assumption that it's constantly highly liquid. Um, and it's kind of embedded in an awful lot of financial models and in an awful lot of financial structures. So that's the kind of the kind of immediate worry, and that's when people are talking about something breaking. That's mm. what they mean. Well, remember that this is our you know our, our defined benefit pension systems are uh, shot through with with yeah. government debt and with bonds in general. And uh, I wrote this week about the cautious portfolio that every wealth yeah, manager yeah. will off offer you, and the uh, the traditional sixty forty again. You know, very heavily fixed income, yeah. and everyone believes that that's safe. This is not safe. And the the idea that a bond bear market can last for a long time is something that everyone has completely forgotten, despite the fact there was a 35-year bond bear market after the war. Yeah, and in fact, I... if you look at the decades in which bonds have uh, uh, not been in a bear market, depending on how you count, they're slightly fewer than the ones when they've been in a bull market. Yeah, I mean, that's the right way around it. You know what I mean. Yeah, no, yeah. you're right. The, the Deutsche Bank study came out the other day and it was something like six, or no, something like eight in 10 of the decades in the 20th century, uh, gilts actually lost you money in, in real, real terms. terms. Um, and, you know, given that we think it's a safe asset, you can think, well, wait a minute, where did, where did we it get that it reputation? Yeah. I mean, there is. And also, I mean, I suppose we've also seen a bit of a massive failure of the collective imagination over the past couple of years because no one thought that bond yields could get to where they are now, um, like six months ago. Well, I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, let's not brag. But, um, but yeah, so it's kind of, um, I, I, you can see why everyone's scared, but th that goes back to the, the second point, which is the longer term problem. So it's not just about stuff blowing up. It's about the fact that we're now moving into a kind of environment for the long run 
where inflation is going to continue to be an issue. And so that means that every, all the assumptions we've been making for the past 40 odd years have kind of flipped on their head, which is uh, something that everyone's going to have to get used to, which means probably the markets will be a lot wobblier as well. Mm, a lot of volatility. Yeah. Oh, it's all so exciting. Now, listen, John, on a, on a more um, um, helpful note, We've decided, haven't we, to always have a personal finance tip of the week. Yes. Yeah, we've got one. Still need a jingle, though. Yeah. I'm hoping you're going to come up with that. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Yeah. John's going to either sing or play an <laughs> instrument next week to introduce the personal finance tip of the week. Now, listen, I'm torn on personal finance tip of the week. There are two things that are quite important at the moment. Well, there's one thing that's very important, and that's our property market, falling property prices, Um paralysis in exchanges, you know, that there, there just isn't that much going through. Chains are back. Chains are back. There's a house on my street that has just sold or come close to selling, but it's abandoned on a chain. There are so many links that can fall through. Things can go wrong. And I didn't even know that this existed, but I've be recently been reading about insurance that you can buy to protect yourself from a collapsing house purchase. And that seems to me like not a bad idea. I'm not a great one for buying pointless insurances, but you can spend a lot of money on getting into the zone of buying a house. And if it then falls through, you can be seriously out of pocket. You do that three or four times, even twice, your deposit is seriously impacted. So is it worth spending, and these insurances seem to cost kind of 60, 80 quid, is that something worth looking at? I wonder if it might be. Definitely worth looking into. Because um, you can easily shell out like a couple of grand whenever you're looking to buy a house and things like surveys and all the rest of it. So if it's only kind of 60 or 70 quid, that probably sounds worth it. And the other thing I want people to look at at the moment is the offset mortgage. You and I remember the offset mortgage because we're getting old. Uh, there was, we remember <laughs> it. We remember it another day long, long ago when interest rates were not zero. Uh, when if you had savings, you could offset them against the debt on your mortgage and that would bring down your, your uh, mortgage payments every month. And it was kind of useful. It's time to look at those again. If you've got a mortgage and you've got savings, go have a look at some of the offsets. They're pretty useful. Excellent tips. Welcome to Merrin Talks Money, the podcast in which people who know the markets explain the markets. I'm Merrin Somerset Webb. This week, our guest is Jeremy Grantham, co-founder of investment firm GMO. Grantham is well known for his analysis of bubbles and for his bearish forecasts that have come at pretty useful times, such as in 2000 and 2008. In our conversation, we talk about where valuations are, where we expect the market to go, and why this has been one of the greatest bubbles of all time. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Now, last time we talked, which was uh, just over two years ago, it was the end of 2021, late actually, middle of August 2021, I think, you and I had a conversation where we talked about how we were in one of the greatest bubbles in financial history, which seemed pretty obvious to you and actually pretty obvious to me at the time, not so obvious to everybody else uh, or some other people. And we talked about where investors could hide from the craziness of that bubble, although we couldn't find very many places. And the best advice you gave uh, my listeners at the time, which was purely absolutely brilliant, and I hope that they all took it, was to rush out and get the longest fixed rate mortgage on their house that they possibly could. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fingers crossed, lots of them did that and are uh, sitting there with a, a 10 year mortgage of one to one and a half percent instead of six to six and a half percent. Yeah, well, if a handful of people did it, we could feel justified. I think so. If we saved anybody. So let's talk about that great bubble. It was excellent timing, and hopefully the listeners also rushed out and sold their overpriced equities because 2022 saw the beginning of the popping of that bubble. And I'm saying the beginning because I'm guessing that what you're going to tell me is that we are only part way through uh, that bubble collapsing. So where, where are we with the whole thing now? Well, everything was proceeding perfectly well, and, and the great bubbles take their time. Quite a few years going up, quite a few years coming down, and and the market suffers from attention deficit disorder. So it, it, it always thinks every rally, the beginning of the next great bull market, and so on. But there were some definitely original interferences with this deflating period. The first of them was what I call the presidential cycle, which I wrote about, suggesting we would have a time out because uh, there's never been a serious market decline between um, October the 1st of the second presidential year and uh, the end of April in the third year, because the administration would like to have a strong labor market running up to the election. And they realize, of course, that economics 
moves rather slowly, a lot of inertia. And so they have to stimulate it a year and a quarter before. And so that's the period of stimulus. And since FDR, there has never been a big decline. And the average gain in that uh, seven month window equals the remaining 41 months, it's amazing, of the four year presidential cycle. It seems impossible, but it's true, check it. And the average gain is about 15% in that window. And this time we had 13 or 14, it was right on the nose. So we had a typical presidential cycle rally and we had a strong January bounce. If you've wiped out the growth stocks, the following January, you always have a great bounce, even if the bear market is not over. The perfect example would be 2001. The tech bubble was huge. It got The growth stocks got hammered in 2000. They were down 50% and then rallied a bit at the end of the year. And then in January, they had a huge rally, eight or nine percent. And uh, so we should have expected the same. And, and basically, we got it a little bit less, but a, a strong um, January rally. Why not? Because there were lots of tax losses that had been taken and people replacing their position, investing their Christmas bonuses and so on. So that was fairly normal. And, and so was the presidential cycle effect. What was abnormal is that they occurred in, in the middle of a great uh, bubble that was uh, on the way down. This had not happened in 1929, 72, or uh, 2000, or 2007. All of them had neatly sidestepped that seven month window. But this one, it fell right in the middle of the deflating phase. So we got a bit of a reprieve as a result of that. Yeah, we got a bit of a temporary reprieve. And then I, I argued uh, back to the meat grinder, but for the meat grinder had time to really get going, we, we ran into the uh, artificial intelligence uh, mini rally. And uh, yes, it was only a dozen or two stocks, but it included some very big ones and they had huge rallies. And um, even though the average stock didn't move, it sent the S&P up, oh, I don't know, 15, 16, 17% this year, year to date. And uh, on the backs of these uh, handful of, of huge names. Okay, so another little reprieve for the index. It, yeah, is artificial intelligence for real? And my answer is yes, absolutely it's for real. It will have huge effect. Is, is it big enough, soon enough to stop the deflating? No, I don't think it is. It, it's a 10, 20 multi-decadal effect going off into the distant future and it, and it it will be huge, and, and in what way, I don't know. It's, it's over my pay grade, but it will be potentially vast in its, in its effects. In the meantime, it lengthened the interruption uh, in, in this deflating period. But under the surface, the um, economics deteriorate, debt increases, consumers spent their, their stimulus program, it's all gone except for maybe the richest 10 or 15 percent that don't really count because they don't spend it as desperately as everybody else does. So, and, and we've taken off the uh, moratorium on paybacks of college loans, which is a huge thing in the US. And uh, the leading indicators, which have a terrific record, continue down. The uh, availability of debt for small companies becomes increasingly difficult to get. Uh, the debt levels themselves at the government level are huge and the interest rates increase, uh, putting a real burden on, on the budget. And uh, many things uh, continue to deteriorate. And uh, my guess is we will have a recession. Uh, I don't know whether it will be fairly mild or fairly serious, uh, but it will probably go deep into next year, as I have been saying for Per year. Okay, but there's still a general view that this is going to be a soft landing. And I think you said before that all landings are soft landings until they become hard landings. Well, every, every bubble has been uh, greeted with a chorus of soft landing. And uh, there's never been one. Uh, Japan, the, great, the greatest bubbles, both in real estate and the stock market, was followed by a lost decade 
mean, arguably the last two decades. But 1929, of course, was mishandled, followed by a depression. Uh, the 1972 Nifty 50 was followed by a very serious recession. And uh, 2000 was followed by a mild recession, still allowed the uh, NASDAQ to decline 72% and the S&P 50%. And uh, the housing bust of 07 was, of course, followed by a potentially disastrous recession, which was counted by biggest stimulus by far in American history up till that point, uh, finally exceeded, amazingly, by the stimulus program around COVID. Uh, and the after effects of which we we are now dealing with. So we have a lot of people saying at the moment that it is extraordinary and impressive how interest rates have gone up so fast. I mean, this is a, the speed of the movers is not been seen for many, well, many hundreds of years, since 1788, someone told me the other day. Uh, and so an incredibly fast move. And the extraordinary thing is that nothing very big has broken yet. But everybody expects something to break. They're just not quite sure what it will be. Well, if they think that, they're being historic, historically rather literate. Because that is the, the pattern. Something breaks and nobody uh, seems to know what it is. You increase the pressure on a very complicated system until a few things snap. And each cycle is different. So each cycle, something else happens. It's always a surprise, but you always have a surprise. So the idea of a surprise is totally unsurprising. <laughs> Can you make any guesses as to what the surprise might be this time? Well, of course, we did have an interesting kind of sneak preview, didn't we, with the large uh, regional banks in America, where a, a couple just upped and went out of business in a, in a flash. Yeah, but unlike most things that turned out to actually be contained and containable, you know, we sat there looking at it thinking, is this it? Is something big breaking? And it turned out that that, was, that could be cleared up. It did indicate that the authorities are very kind of well aware of this something breaking effect because they, they moved very quickly and one could argue overzealously gave a blanket, a safety net to everybody Maybe you could argue that people should have been able to analyze the vulnerability of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and so on to uh, the VC industry and, uh, and to the level of uh, high yields, the pain that high yields would, would inflict on their large portfolio of rock bottom investments. They, they had made a huge number, uh, unprecedented actually in the banking industry, the percentage of their portfolio that was invested in very low uh, yielding paper, just in time uh, to be hit hard by an increase in rates. The combination of that very large component uh, and the fact that they were uniquely dependent on VC. And VC is itself, along with real estate, kind of guaranteed to take a lot of pain in, in these kinds of cycles. The VC industry has being the only part so far that has moved along at a much quicker pace and uh, is fairly deep into uh, trouble. The, the IPOs completely ceased and uh, the money flowing into new VCs uh, dropped way down, uh, fell to uh, about a third um, in, a, in a real hurry. So the VC industry acted as if there was a major bubble breaking uh, and uh, the rest of the market, particularly the growth end and the uh, artificial intelligence end, uh, had a had a much easier time. Yeah. Does it feel like maybe it is the private equity slash VC part of the market that is most vulnerable at the moment? And you've got a lot of debt piled up in there. You've got a lot of companies that are burning cash fast and require more cash put in. We're hearing quite a lot about private equity businesses having to borrow at uh, unexpectedly high rates. And we're wondering what happens over the next couple of years in that industry. It's plausible that they would feel the pain quickest. Everything to do with real estate, of course, is pretty much certain, although the delays and special cases there are much more impressive. But eventually, it grinds through. And when you lower the mortgage, people can afford to pay more. And eventually, they pay more and push up the prices. So at 3%, you're paying 400,000 for your house. 
And when the mortgage goes to 6%, you suddenly realize you can't afford to buy the house, you pull your bid, market backs off, and eventually the prices come down. So mortgages move to fill the available affordability, and uh, house prices uh, do exactly that. They're not reliable in the short term, they're incredibly reliable in the long term. And over a 40 year period of driving down uh, mortgage rates, of course, you drove up house prices all over the world, pretty much. And, um, and now that rates have gone up, of course, it will drive down. And, and the ones that flow through quickly, some of the Scandinavian countries like Sweden have a, have a fairly severe housing pullback. The ones that have a more convoluted system, more locked in mortgages like the US, they, they take their time. But eventually, people can't afford to buy a house at a high mortgage and the prices come down. So that's pretty reliable. Yeah, and you can see that happening across the world, can't you? You can see house prices coming down all over Europe and Canada, beginning in the US, particularly in Scandinavia and in the UK, it's increasingly obvious as well, because we're at that we're at that point where no one's buying and no one's selling. We're at the, the paralysis stage before you would expect prices to fall quite dramatically. And that's exactly the same in the US, paralysis. And house prices are worse for the ordinary household. They're worse for the economy than stocks because they're substantially more broadly owned. It's really an important part of the median family's income picture and, and capital picture, and it is not stocks on it. And uh, so the, the, the motto should be don't, don't mess with housing. The, the super motto should be never have a housing bubble at the same time as you have a stock market bubble, which is the, the great a mistake that the Japanese made with the biggest bubble in history on both fronts at the same time. But although, although we didn't get carried away with ridiculous subprime this time, the multiple of family income actually went higher than it did in, in uh, 2007. So in, in terms of actual long-term vulnerability posed by overpricing, this housing market uh, was more overpriced. And it was accompanied by a much more overpriced and classically bubbly stock market than, than uh, 2007. Okay, so we can see it working its way through the housing market across the world. But obviously, all the stock markets are different because they've come out of this bubble at different valuation levels, with the US possibly being the most expensive. So what can we expect to see happen to the US stock market in particular now? The most vulnerable area would, in my opinion, is is uh, the Russell 2000 is a, a good measure of where the vulnerabilities will be. The Russell 2000 often has no collective earnings at all. It has a very high density of zombies, companies that really can only pay their interest payments by issuing more debt. Um, it has never been higher than it is today. And um, they have a very high ratio, something like 40% don't have positive earnings and uh, they have record debt. They have never had this kind of debt. So they're vulnerable on the debt front, vulnerable on the financial front, and vulnerable on a broad economic front. And um, this is the interesting thing. The Russell 2000 is not up in real terms for the last year. It's not up over two years. And really surprising, it's not up over five years. It's actually down quite a bit over five years. So it is showing its vulnerability. And uh, it brings up a, a, a kind of sidebar. Why don't people state everything inflation adjusted? We always did in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And we have now forgotten, because we had a 25-year window where inflation was dribbling down towards nothing, uh, and we lost the habit. Because people think, oh, well, the S&P 500 is almost at its high. The S&P 500 is about 18% below its high. It's high a year and nine months ago, uh, and there's been decent inflation in that window, at least seven, maybe 8%, uh, plus the market is down. In any case, uh, about 10%. The, the markets are not doing as well as people think because they, they have lost the knack of taking off inflation. Inflation is every bit as painful as any other percentage point loss. 
But it isn't, though, is it? I mean, it isn't in, in people's minds. I mean, in, in some senses, this is a, a great way for things to be brought back to ground by a couple of years of, of relatively high inflation. So people don't feel like they're losing all their hard-earned money. They don't feel as though their house prices collapsed, etc. If it only happens in real terms as opposed to in nominal terms, generally pe- assuming people feel happier about it. You're right. They're more easily misguided into thinking they're doing fine, except when they go to the supermarket where the reverse end. If anything, they over-respond to it. So they come out of the supermarket thinking that inflation will crush them. And they accept a £10,000 loss on their house from inflation without even noticing it. The other thing, though, is it does, it does take down their, their debts, inflation. So there, there is an offset. If you have a very big mortgage and you have 10% inflation, you, you owe 10% less. And that, sadly, has always slipped through unnoticed also. Yeah, and then so, if, you're, if your salary goes up at the same time, if your salary matches inflation, then in some senses, for a lot of people, an inflationary environment, as long as it doesn't get out of control, in a situation like this, isn't too bad. I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying it's not so bad. You might say that, but if you actually ask them how they feel, the results are quite conclusively uh, opposite. Uh, people's uh, confidence in the economy uh, is is very low in the UK and the US. If you ask them, do you feel better off than last year? Almost nobody uh, says they feel better off, even though uh, obviously quite a large fraction are better off in real life. The results are the rich and the poor are feeling a little squeezed in today's environment. So I I, I think you're wrong in that sense. It does does reach right through into uh, consumer confidence. Now, if you, if you have a lot of money in the piggy bank from the government's program, stimulus program, that's a huge offset. And that, that has been uh, very successful in keeping, keeping spending going. And there were some other psychological factors that people were so wildly enthusiastic to come out of COVID and get on a plane and go to Spain again and so on and spread their wings and have a meal out. Uh, that they they have done that so enthusiastically that they've run through all their COVID savings. And now they are racking up credit card debt like there's no tomorrow and building up their aggregate debt level. Uh, They've never saved less in America, you may be aware, uh, than they're saving now. Never, ever. I mean, the savings rate has just about disappeared. But nonetheless, nonetheless, this, this inflation plus the falls in the market do mean that, and you wrote about this in in, in your latest note um, about the meat grinder, that quite a lot of the stocks that we look at have already come off very significantly in real terms. You say, for example, the likes of Amazon, Alphabet, and Meta uh, would have to rise between 70 and 150 percent to get back to their 2021 peaks in real terms. So we've seen an awful lot of froth come off the market in real terms. And I suspect there are some groups of more enthusiastic growth investors than perhaps you or I are looking at those prices and saying, well, this is a perfectly good place to get back in. Well, they typically do that. And uh, in in a multi-legged bear market, they always have uh, plenty of people buying into each leg. And I've no reason to think this would be any exception. Once you've seen a stock sell at 300, even if it's intrinsically worth 100, you you feel somehow it has a divine right to go back to 300. So when it comes down to 200, you think it's a massive bargain, even though its intrinsic value may be 100. So you go whooping in there and you buy it, and then it comes the second leg down to 150, still looks pretty good. And then eventually it comes down to 100 and you're heartbroken and you sell it anyway and it goes down to 80. And it's actually cheap. Uh, and then as, you can't uh, buy it again because you've been too hurt. Yes, now you're paralyzed yeah. and, and, and hurt. Um, and, and that's when I get to write uh, Reinvesting When Terrified in, yes. in 2009. Uh, when, and when people are so paralyzed, they don't care that it's the cheapest prices for 22 years. Uh, and GMO's famously, allegedly bearish forecast had double digit real returns uh, for seven years uh, in everything, including the S&P 500. Yeah, but you had to be brave in 2009, didn't you? 
I mean, there were several well, strategists. Not- you were you possibly one of the loudest voices saying, you know, if you buy now, you've got an excellent chance of making extraordinary returns over the next decade. It was hard so to do. Why, why do you have to be brave? I, I would argue you have to be brave buying when prices are extended and high because you're much more likely to lose money. It, it's, it's just a perception. But the real bravery required is uh, to buy when, when the market is smashed down to a bargain. Seems to me very little. But that's not now, is it? No, that that's is not, not now. now. If, you look at, if you look at the most predictive measures, and uh, Mr. Hussman does the, the best of those, very detailed histor- historical record of which ones actually do the best predictive measure. It isn't Warren Buffett's uh, uh, price to book uh, compared to GDP. It's an um, interesting, more sophisticated measure of, of earnings taking out financial companies and so on. And, uh, and those measures are about as high as they have ever been today. Uh, they're in the top two or three percent of all time. There's a spike. Um, there's a spike in 2000, and there's a spike in in in, in 2021, uh, and uh, this is above 2000, but below the spike in 2021. But we are right up there. In in order to get the market down to a level where it would typically out yield the long bond by five percent, which it should, which you could argue it should, uh, the market would. Just sheer arithmetic, the market would have to drop by more than 50%. This is not my forecast. I, I have a very uh, genteel forecast that anything below 3,000 would make me uh, think that it was reasonable. And if everything works out badly, which it sometimes does, I would not be amazed if it went to 2,000 on the S&P. Um, but that would, that would require uh, a couple of wheels to fall off. And wheels tend to fall off in the great and the great bubbles unraveling, but it doesn't mean they have to. So, uh, but it would be unlikely not to get to something close to, to three, 3,000 on the S&P. Now, what could turn that around, of course, is um, inflation falling right back, right back to 2% or below, which is, is not impossible, um, and interest rates then falling back as well, because we know, don't we, that markets really like low steady inflation. We know they really like low steady interest rates. We know that they hate high and volatile inflation. So, and there is a, an expectation in large parts of the market, although I think that's being tested over the last couple of weeks, there has been an expectation that eventually inflation would end up back at target and that we would see rates begin to come off. Now, the, the higher for longer story is beginning to get a bit more traction, but that's relative. The recent so shift in the inflation or interest rate environment would change things. The uh, the model that Ben Inker and I did uh, twenty years ago has got a very very high correlation explaining PE. It doesn't predict it. It just says how do we get here. And it turns out the market is really a coincident indicator of comfort. What does it take to make a a portfolio manager comfortable in an institution? And the answer is as you suggest steady inflation around 2%. It hates inflationary spikes and and very high profit margins. And um, profit margins have been drifting down and uh, more than people realize. And inflation has been uh, bouncing around, but it's part of the scenery now. And the model says a Schiller PE should be about 16.8, which is decently above average and doesn't doesn't sound ridiculously low. Uh, and that's because the profit margins are still decent. Uh, but what is it? Well, a few weeks ago, it was uh, 2930. <laughs> so it was not responding in the normal way. This is only the second time. It, it, it had a bit of a holiday in 2000. Uh, our model said we should have the highest PE in history. Everything is perfect. And the market said you're darn right and went much higher than that even for uh, 18 months. That's the, you could argue, the far and away the, out, the outlier in speculative craziness. And, and the second time was when inflation spiked in, uh, in uh, 2022, or was it 2021? Yeah, 2021. 2021, it's, it started. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, 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 uh, in the summer of 2021, you had a rapidly rising, unexpected inflationary jag 
and the market continued to rise for the whole half year. And so you had a huge di divergence in our model. And, and the, the first half, the wipeout in the first half of 2022 was the biggest decline in the first half of the year since 1939, incidentally, in real terms. And, and, but it didn't close the gap because inflation, the longer it stayed there, uh, the worse the model got. And, and, and the profit margins began to decline a bit. Well, that was interesting, profit margins beginning to decline, wasn't it? Because one of the things that we've talked about before is how extraordinary it is that something that always mean reverts, i.e. profit margins, did not mean revert. And a lot of us have been waiting to see profit margins start to come down. They didn't, and they didn't, and they didn't. And even now, it's a pretty gradual erosion. Yes, it is. And, and if you want to uh, further narrow that story to what they now call the Magnificent Seven, um, there has never been, ever, ever, such a divergence in favor of the U.S. in total corporate earnings. Uh, since 2010, so this is a recent event, uh, the U.S. has outperformed the rest of the developed world by uh, about 70 percentage points. So you could say, well, in that case, they should have done 70 percentage points better, and, and they did. More than that, because they... And the market always goes in for double counting. So if you have unexpectedly good profit margins, you get an unexpected increase in price earnings ratio, which also happened. Um, any case, if you go back to the 70% outperformance and you take out the then so-called fangs, um, you find that uh, the 90, you know, the 95% or more, the ordinary American stocks, uh, looked um, very much like the rest of the world. They, their performance was a little bit better. Their earnings were a little bit better, but in the normal range. And then you have the Magnificent Seven, whose performance in earnings was unprecedented by a wide margin, and whose performance in, in the stock market was even more unprecedented because they not only had the earnings, uh, but they had a steady rise in P.E., so you've had the sudden emergence of multi-trillion dollar market caps. Um, quite an amazing world. And, and culminating in this year, where if you took out the Magnificent Seven today, uh, the S&P would not be up for the year. It may be up a point, but little or nothing. And, and, uh, and all of the... 10 or 12 point rally is carried by uh, carried by the magnificent seven there has never been such a narrow market now what will happen to them is a very interesting question is it not will they continue to grow and and become 70% uh, of the entire world's market cap will, will they be attacked by governments will they attack each other grow into each other's markets and beat down their profit margins? Will new technologies arise and end run the iPhone uh, or whatever? Uh, who knows? Uh, I noticed back in the Nifty 50 uh, of 1972, that's when 50 high quality companies like Coca-Cola and IBM uh, went to a 50% premium in fair value against the market. It's the one time when quality stocks had a huge bubble. And one of the reasons was that none of them had failed. There were no failures in the Nifty 50 group for 15 years uh, prior to 1972. And after 1972, they actually started to die off like flies. We had Avon, we had Polaroid, we had Exxon, we had Eastman Kodak, we had IBM half-wounded, or seriously wounded, I should say, and on it went. Uh, they lost their magic and they lost their huge premium, uh, and and they and they did not and they underperformed badly for a, for, for a decade. Will that happen to these new uh, Nifty Seven? Um, that that's a question that, that that is unanswerable, I think, because each one of them depends on a completely different slice of of the economy. Tesla has relatively little in common with Apple. Both of them are, you know, Tesla's a metal basher, 
Apple is a metal basher with lots of software, and, and then you move into the into the uh, hundred percent software enterprises, the uh, Googles and Amazons and Facebooks. It's a very complicated set of issues, and to which I don't have the answer. But I, I have pretty much faith that in aggregate, when you add them to the market, and and you look at the price. You can't get blood out of a stone. If you've sent, if you've sent the Schiller PE up towards thirty, you are unlikely uh, to get more than a three percent real return out of that. It's the reciprocal of thirty, and the market really expects twice that, doesn't? It? So sooner or later, the simple arithmetic suggests. You'll either have a dismal return forever, or you'll have a nice bear market and then a normal return. And the nice bear market will be hopefully less than a 50% decline, but it won't be a huge amount less from the peak than 50% in real terms. In real terms. Okay, well, I think we've established where the bubbles still are. Um, but hopefully we can discuss some opportunities. I mean, obviously, every does, everyone doesn't want to be entirely in cash, and that wouldn't be particularly healthy either. Uh, where, where should people be putting their money at the moment? I suspect you're going to say value. Well, if you've spent 40 years running down interest rates until recently, um, you, you've basically spent 40 years pushing up assets led by real estate, as we've said, but everything eventually follows for the same for the same logic. If I'm paid a negative return in the piggy bank, I better reach for yield and, and so on. And that game has gone on. So global real estate is universally overpriced. Farms and forests, you know, fine art, universally overpriced. The aberration is the stock markets outside the US. Why were they so ordinary? is slightly bewildering to me. Um, I suppose 2000, the, the tech bubble was a bit similar, but it, it seems a little implausible that, that your typical assets like real estate would become overpriced everywhere from Canada to Australia. And yet in the stock market, most of the, mo most of the markets were kind of overpriced, but ordinary. Ordinarily and, and overpriced, reasonable. yeah ordinarily overpriced and, and a few were underpriced and, and they were investable and not just emerging markets but the developed world outside the US was investable and is investable. So Japan, uh, most of Europe, the UK, there is some, I mean we always look at the UK and Japan, John and I, I think they are the cheapest markets. Yeah, they, they look uh, two amongst the cheaper ones for sure. and and. Uh, Emerging is, of course, very complicated with China, but in, in general, the rest of the world seems investable. Do your analysis, you know, make your mistakes, etc. cetera, but, but it's reasonable. Um, so don't invest in real estate. Don't invest in the U.S. And if you have to invest in the U.S., and most institutions do, I would urge you to take a good look at quality. Quality has been the mispriced asset for 100 years. Um, the AAA bond, uh, everyone understands, will pay you 1% less. The AAA stock has paid you uh, half a percent more. Now, what the heck is that? Actually, I can explain it. Uh, they outperform in bear markets. They underperform in bull markets. Why do they underperform in bull markets? Because they're boring. In a bull market, you want to own Tesla. You want to own meme stocks. You want to own uh, what's flying. You don't want to own Coca-Cola. It's just too boring. In the long run, Coca-Cola does very well. In the bear markets, they do particularly on average. But uh, that's a free lunch. It's the only free lunch. It was totally missed by the French and farmers of the world back in the day. Uh, you, they were quite correctly saying price to book wins because it's a risk factor. Of course, it's a risk factor. Price to book is, is the market's description of who's got the junkiest, ugliest assets. PE is the market's judgment on who's got the flakiest earnings, etc. Uh, but when it comes to quality, they have less risk of every kind. They have less debt. They go bankrupt less. They have less volatility. They have a lower beta, yet they outperform. 
That is a free lunch. And they're not hideously overpriced at the moment? Absolutely not. No, they, they've they moderately outperformed for the last year, the last 10 years, the last 50 years, and the last 100 years. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that my firm, GMO, has made a big fuss about them from the very beginning. They play a big role in our, our value models, and we have a fund that does a very good job of thinking about how to treat them, which ones to buy, and what really constitutes quality. Quality, by the way, uh, in a nutshell, is your element of monopoly. High returns, low debt. Low debt, of course, goes along with the high stable returns. High stable returns is another way of saying you're a price, price setter. And a price setter is another way of saying you have a monopoly element. Um, and, and, and the amazing thing about the Magnificent Seven is they're all global monopolies. And they sprang out of the ground pretty darn quickly. And, um, and, and of course, the Justice Department, the anti-monopoly element uh, in the US and the UK has been largely sound asleep uh, for the last 20 years. So they've had a wonderful environment in which to operate and they have done a wonderful job of uh, capitalizing on that and moving very fast. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the investing in the energy transition. I, we've been looking at the renewable stocks and obviously you have as well, and they've been having a fairly torrid time recently, the wind and the solar companies. And you might have expected uh, something rather different given the rush to net zero across, across the world. I wondered if you had any thoughts on how to invest or not to invest in the transition. The thing about transitions is they're very tricky. They're characterized by even more booms and busts than, than uh, anywhere else. And so um, oil, oil and, and alternative energy will, will be a trickier area than most. Uh, climate resources, the same. The thing about uh, climate investing, however, is that they will have an enormous top line revenue advantage, other things being even. The countries of the world finally have woken up and maybe a few are in the process of still wake, waking up to get behind uh, the idea that climate is a big problem and needs to be addressed and they're beginning to address it and throw money at it subsidies mainly instead of a carbon tax but you can't expect perfection and so Going back Andrea, to no, I have, to, I have to interrupt you there. Your, your preferred way of dealing with this would be a blanket carbon tax on, on everything, and that would let the market sort this out for itself, whereas the subsidies are a much more inefficient way of doing it. Absolutely. I am not a great believer in economists in general. I think they've lost the plot for the last 70 years. They've forgotten their job description, which is to be useful. Uh, that They drown in assumptions and, and closed systems which are largely speaking irrelevant for everything except their reputation inside their industry. But they have gotten one thing right. They all agree that, that a carbon tax is the vastly more efficient way uh, to address climate change and, and produce a source of very useful government revenue. But it's opposed by a very powerful industry, which has, particularly in America, enormous political uh, influence and therefore it's very hard to do it. And e each of the oily countries uh, have, have a lot of political influence. Uh, so Australia, Canada, the UK, uh, and of course, in spades, in the US. But I just wanted to finish that you, you asked the question what to invest in. And I said, if you have to invest in the US, look at quality, but also climate change uh, is going to outgrow the, the rest of the economy by a lot. It's going to dominate investing and, and the need for money for the next many decades. Uh, it doesn't mean though, uh, it won't have an element of commodities. Commodities break your heart because just as they're doing well, they have a wipeout for, for 18 months and then they go roaring back to a new high. It's intrinsically a difficult, dangerous area, but it, it, but it will have enormous growth potential. And, and so, uh, if you can find a competent source of investors, I, I would, of course, recommend climate change over the rest of the U.S. market. Okay. And is there anything to be said for investing in the oil companies on the basis that we're going to need oil for many, many years to come, but supply is constrained, and so you might get uh, 
a fairly long term supply of cash pouring off the oil companies, possibly in the same way that you have off the, the tobacco companies in the last couple of decades, that might make a, a reasonable medium term investment for people looking for income. Yeah, no, it's quite possible. The uh, trouble with commodities, um, tobacco was never a commodity, but oil is, is that the uh, everything hinges on the marginal barrel, a couple of barrels too many, and the price goes down to 30 couple of barrels too few and it goes to 100. And that will always be the case. Now, the uh, takeoff of EVs, which represents a lot of oil, uh, is moving much faster than people are twigging onto. The US is lagging badly, but it's just left from three to eight. This week will be 8% of all cars sold will be EVs. But in the world in general, it's 16. In Europe, over 20. And in China, 35. It's the biggest market in the world. It's 35 and growing rapidly, which means within five years, uh, oil demand will take a very big hit. And since oil is determined on the margin, um, that would suggest there's too many oil companies, too much oil capability uh, in a suddenly reduced demand world, which uh, typically would be absolute rack and ruin. In the meantime, however, you have the following paradox, that the faster you ramp up EVs, wind, solar, battery storage, the faster you ramp up your demand for energy, because wind, solar, and storage are all resources up front, energy up front, labor up front, capital up front. Once you put them in the ground, it's practically free for the lifespan of the asset 20, 30, 40 years. And uh, EVs, of course, have that element built into their batteries, which is a very big chunk of the total. And so they are much more money up front. They're incidentally more affected by the rise in interest rates, which is a short term problem. But um, what it means is we have an enormous demand for resources really outside our ability to meet it consistently uh, in the next few years. We have to invent our way uh, around, we have to substitute for these resources, we have to find cheaper ways of extracting them and so on and so forth. And even so, uh, the prices will be uh, in their usual volatile way going higher, lithium, copper, cobalt, nickel being the critical four. But energy is more important even than that. And there will be a, a terrible push on the demand for energy. And a lot of that is oil, a lot of it is gas, a lot of it is coal. Um, but it will be fairly remorseless pressure. Uh, and the question is, where do you go uh, ramping up from 16% uh, EVs to the global fleet being 60, say, somewhere in that range, the tipping point comes where the squeeze on oil uh, upwards becomes a consistent squeeze on oil downwards. And I, I don't know, it's a sensitive business. I don't know exactly where that inflection point will come, but you should not be surprised if the price of oil doesn't go over 100, maybe once or twice in the next five years. And you should not be surprised. No, you should be amazed if the price of oil does not then have a long-term crunch. Uh, and it will run down to a level where uh, the Saudis or somebody will be able to grind out uh, $45 oil into the setting sun. Um, that's how I think the game will end. It's interesting, isn't it? You talk about this that uh, huge demand for resources up front. I think is something that that people are only just beginning to grasp. That in order to get to the clean side, we have to do a lot of really, really grubby stuff first. Really, really grubby stuff. And even in the long run, you need a lot of metals which are grubby in order to get to a green world. Sorry, guys. Sorry, you purists. <laughs> there is no way around that one. Yeah, there's no clean route to clean. No. Interesting. I will let you go in a tick. I know I've kept you longer than I promised, but I wanted to ask you one last thing, which is when we last spoke, um, you said that your foundation was putting an awful lot of money into venture capital, and that was the place where you still thought that American exceptionalism was was absolutely on. Uh, do, you, do you still feel like that about the venture capital industry? I and mean, we talked about it a little earlier in our conversation, but I wanted to come back to, to you and how, how you've been investing. Yeah, no, ob obviously, um, venture capital participated in, in the bubble, had a huge run up in, in prices uh, 
2020-2021 and will have a fairly high price to pay over, over the next year or so. But in the long run, it is amazing the quality of the people the American VC industry attracts. It's getting the best and the brightest who used to go into consulting or Goldman Sachs. And now that now they go into VC uh, and startups, and they come from all over the world. Uh, at least a quarter of the bosses of all the VC companies we talk to are are uh, were not born in America. And um, what 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 an achievement for the U.S. We have the great research universities, fifteen of the twenty, uh, and most of the rest are in the U.K. But the, the fifteen great research universities are the bedrock for for so many of these VCs. And you add that to a societal attitude to taking risk in the U.S. is simply much better than, than Europe. We, we will forgive people a failure. If they go into a startup and they fail and they come back four years later with another bright idea, uh, they'll get funded. And, and it will hang over their heads in most parts of the world if you fail, but not in the U.S. Now, we have a wonderful aggressive attitude to risk taking, and we need to because the whole future of, of transferring to green is, is a thousand problems need solving. We need entrepreneurs, we need research, we need breakthroughs, and, and we need to keep moving fast. And, and in the end, the theory should be that VC, because it's riskier, has more failures, because it has more failures and more risk, it should have a higher return. And, and the practice is that it has. Uh, if you look at the database for the last 20 years, uh, VC has the highest return, uh, as it should, of any sector uh, in the marketplace. So to be into green VC is to go into the highest return sector uh, with with uh, the biggest support from global governments and the U.S. That's a yes, then, I think. And Jerry, <laughs> I ask every one of our guests, but I ask every one it's of our warm guests. Recommendation. It's a warm recommendation. I ask every one of our guests before I let them go the same question. I'm embarrassed to ask you this, but as I ask everybody, I have to ask you as well. I hope you don't mind. If, if I was only going to give you one thing to keep for 10 years and I gave you a choice of only three things, gold, Bitcoin, or cash on deposit, what would it be? I, I take gold. I'm not happy with gold, but um, in a world where inflation could come back, I think I'll take gold. Bitcoin is, of course, a, an elaborate uh, scam, really. But um, gold is the, the least bad of the three. Brilliant. Um, least bad is good enough for me. Jeremy, thank you so much. No, you're very welcome. Thanks for listening to this week's Merrin Talks Money. We'll be back next week. Catch our debrief on this week's conversation on the Merrin Talks Money after show under the Apple subscription feed. In the meantime, if you like our show, rate, review and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. This episode was hosted by me, Merrin Somerset Webb. It was produced by Sam Asadi. Additional editing by Blake Maples. Special thanks, of course, to Jeremy Grantham and to John Stepek. Finally, be sure to sign up to John's daily newsletter, Money Distilled. I know I always say that you won't regret it, but trust me, you really, really won't. The link is in the show notes. Listener.